So we're going to dive right into our next round of uh, talks to see if we can stay relatively on time. Um, so to begin this next session, we have Harman Busmacher, who's coming from Columbia University and will be talking to us about feature-based recognition models from SelectSeq data. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the uh, opportunity to talk about our work. This title is different than what's in the program, but basically it's going to be partly about AR and GR and then with a little bit more introduction. Uh, and I managed to leave my iPhone in my car, so whenever I reach into my pocket and I seem to like startled, it's because I expect my phone there. Um, anyway, I hope uh, I won't be too distracted by that. Okay, so um, just by way of uh, background, why do we bother to build these quantitative models for protein DNA interaction, right? Why work so hard? Because, you know, maybe a motif is good enough. Um, and one paper I liked uh, a lot that made a good point about this is uh, by Merck and Quake, uh, the first Mitomi paper, where they measured affinities for two different closely related HLH factors, um, helix loop helix factors, and then purely based on this in vitro data of specificity, these measurements scanned the promoter regions of the yeast genome in this case and tried to predict what genes are the targets of these uh, two different factors. And then they did, you know, genotology enrichment analysis. Um, and they found that the kind of Go categories that they got for these two factors are completely different. And they are, you know, what they should be. Um, and this is the, the data on the, actually where is, oh, here's the pointer. Uh, the data here on the, um, on the left, these are the actual affinities for the first factor whose categories are shown here, and for the second factor, they're almost indistinguishable. All the differences that lead to these kind of qualitative differences in function prediction are all shown here. This is the complete data set of the in vitro specificity. So that tells you that, you know, you, you got to work hard on getting the numbers right, and then maybe you can make these kind of biologically functional uh, predictions and help interpret expression data, look, you know, understand genetic variation in expression, etc. But the foundation is these good models, and that's why I guess a lot of us in the audience and, and people who use these models are interested in this. Um, now, in my lab, we spent a lot of time in recent years on SELEC-seq analysis. This is a technology that was it's similar to high-throughput SELEX, but we do it in an EMSA gel, so we can look at specific complexes, and this was done in collaboration with uh, Richard Mann at Columbia, Remo Rose, who's here, and Barry Honig a couple of years ago. Uh, and we've been building on this computationally and experimentally in different ways. And it's just starting to give the first results, uh, these, these efforts. And there's a few posters from my lab, too, that, that will tell you a little bit more about it. Um, now, the way we were analyzing the data in this paper and, you know, in, in some related papers was in terms of KMER enrichment, essentially, right? You normalize your KMER counts in some late round of, by the, the input round, um, and then you scale them so that you get a number between zero and one, and that's the score for that KMER. Um, and that's, that's a great first pass of, you know, interpreting the data, but there's a downside too, because the relationship between these different sequences uh, is not captured, right? Every, each of these is, is, is uh, the, the affinity for it is, um, 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 is quantified or estimated separately. Also, there's different shifted versions of this motif that occur in the table. And there's ways of using sequence pattern to filter these, and then you can do downstream analyses. Uh, but it's still a problem that we try to uh, set out to solve in a more systematic way. Um, and this is based on just equilibrium binding, and a lot of the current methods that we've heard about already today are based on this simple idea of a binding equilibrium, where if some protein binding to DNA, if you make a mutation to the, um, to the binding site, you get a reduction in affinity that, you know, you could call an element of a, of a weight matrix, an affinity matrix, or, or you know, a frequency matrix. But it's, and this is really the e to the power of the delta delta g, the change in binding free energy uh, uh, due to that mutation in the DNA sequence, right? Um, if you have more than one mutation, you start to multiply the reduction in affinity associated with each mutation, uh, or you start to add up the, the free energy changes. Uh, and this actually can be generalized from a weight matrix to DNA shape features and dinucleotide features, et cetera. 
right? So in general, you could say if I make a mutation from a reference sequence to a mutated sequence, um, I change a bunch of different things. I could lose an A at position 5, gain a C at position uh, 5, or I could change the minor groove width at some offset within the binding site by two angstroms, uh, et cetera, right? Um, and and um, um, we and, and Remo, Raluca, and other people in, um, uh, in recent years have been, uh, been trying to explore this uh, uh, approach. Um, now, this slide gives a little bit of uh, the history of these kind of biophysical models for protein DNA interaction. Um, uh, starting with Gary Stormo, who of course has done a lot of pioneering work, in 1986 he did the first regression model where he had a bunch of me measurements of binding affinities and inferred free energies from them as regression parameters. Um, and just to make a point that science progresses slowly, 20 years later, uh, you know, Barrett Foth in my lab developed, we basically added the sum to this equation. We started to add a sliding window to the probe because we said we don't know where the binding site is within the PBM probe, for instance, right? And then another a couple of years later, there was a positional weight added to this, and it was either called Bevel PBM or feature reduce, uh, right? Um, but we're interested in Celex data because it's very high resolution. Um, um, and it has the potential of being able to look at much larger footprints of transcription factors uh, than, uh, um, than with, with, say, PVMs. Although with dedicated PVMs, of course, you can look at specific uh, families. But, you know, historically, my lab has been moving into the CELEX direction. And basically, where we are in terms of the analysis method for CELEX is in this 1986 um, stage. And we've been trying to go to the 2000. Uh, six stage. And we, we can get a lot of insight from, from the feature-based models when you kind of have an aligned set of uh, KMER affinities or uh, genomic context uh, PBMs, right? Um, but solving this problem that you don't know where the binding site is within the sequence, that's a computationally hard problem that we've been trying to, uh, to really um, get at in the last uh, couple of years. And it's been surprisingly hard to, to do this in a principled way, but we're just having our first set of algorithms uh, for this that I'd like to tell you about. Okay. The first algorithm is a more pragmatic algorithm. It's implemented in R. Um, it's based on generalized linear models and the Poisson regression. And it basically assumes that there's one um, dominant binding site in each probe, in each um, um, DNA molecule in the CELEX library. Uh, we're actually building on a bunch of, of very efficient functionality in Bioconductor, the CELEX package that, that we developed, that um, was based on the methodology uh, in the, by, developed by Todd Riley and in, the, in, the, in the, our CELEX paper. But Chaitanya Arostogi is actually in the back of the room, um, work with, uh, with another uh, student in the lab to, to have a very efficient implementation of all the KMR counting uh, required for this. Um, and you know, this, this runs uh, relatively quickly. And the great thing is that we can fit wave matrices over a footprint of up to 30 base pairs. And this is what allowed us to discover a difference in um, specificity in the flanks of the hormone receptors, androgen and glucocorticoid receptor. It still requires seeding with the KMER, so it's not uh, you know, the, the, the algorithm in the end that, that, uh, where you could just give it a data and it would come up with a model, although we do have that, and I'll say a few things, words about it at the end of the talk. Okay? This shows the crystal structure of the AR and the GR superimposed. Um, and only when there are amino acid differences between those two proteins uh, do you see red here. All the red is on top of the DNA binding domain or like to the sides away from the DNA. The point here is to make uh, is that to show that there's basically complete conservation of the amino acid identities at the interface of about 15 base pair that is classically considered to be, you know, what the binding site is for a homodimer of either AR or a GR. Um, and we've been uh, collaborating with um, uh, Liang Zhang and, um, in the Mouse Pufal's lab in U Iowa uh, on Celex data for this um, for these two uh, homodimers. Uh, so they've performed a, a series of great CELEX experiments on these factors. And we, when we analyzed these data using the, the pipeline that we used for the, for the Hox paper a couple of years ago, it seems that there's much more, a much larger footprint up to like in the lower 20s where there's still uh, information to be gained as you make your window, your KMER window larger, if you use KMER-based uh, approaches. So that suggested to us that you really have to go beyond 15 base pairs, which is not possible to do uh, 
uh, with these um, uh, camera-based uh, methods. And this is why we developed uh, this uh, Poisson regression algorithm that where we can actually infer delta delta G, like free energy parameters. And this shows a comparison between two rounds of CELEX. And there's actually error bars on our energy parameters. And it's very good agreement between uh, rounds. Um, in this slide, I'm showing free energy logos that we first developed in the, in the for the matrix reduced paper 10 years ago um, for AR and for GR. And the difference between these is that there's poly A stretches in the flanks of, of the AR binding site outside of the 15 base pair uh, core region that is thought to be the, you know, where all the action is for these hormone receptors. And GR basically is specificity is contained within this 15, 15 base pair region, but for AR it extends beyond that. Um, and actually, if you just take the top sequence for the AR according our, to our model, this is a simple one base uh, feature model, uh, and, and run Remo's you know, shape server on it. Um, these actually are the error bars from his shape parameters. Uh, you see there's a significant dip, like a narrowing of the minor groove just outside of the 15 base pair, either on the 5 prime end or the 3 prime end of this binding site. So maybe that's what's going on. It's, it's a shape-based uh, uh, interaction. Although we didn't get more explicit about this. Although I'll, I'll say one more thing about it in the, on the next slide. So to confirm that this is real, uh, first in a different technology, a different platform, isothermal colorimetry, ITC, uh, Liang did an experiment um, looking at a couple of different sequences that differed in their flanking uh, basis outside of the 15 base pair region. The red point here is the highest affinity according to our prediction, and it's well above the sequence that don't have the poly A sequence. And that's confirmed by the, the KA that, that it comes from these ITC measurements. Actually, the nice thing about ITC is that you can separately measure the entropic and the enthalpic effect. Um, and minor groove interactions are you know, supposed to be um, charge driven. And indeed, the, the difference in, um, in affinity uh, for these poly A flank sequences uh, is mostly due to an enthalpic effect. So that's consistent with, with kind of electrostatic readout um, at the minor group. The other way in which we would try to validate um, this finding of a difference between the two factors from the CELEX data is using chip seq data. Uh, um, and it's a little subtle to do this uh, properly because both weight matrix matrices are very good at distinguishing random DNA from hormone receptor binding sites, right? That's not the hard problem. We wanted to validate something more subtle. We wanted to say that you know, the AR weight matrix that we found is a better predictor of the chip enrichment if you, if you uh, IP AR than the GR matrix. So we did a model analysis where we let the weight matrices that we inferred from the CELEX data for AR and GR compete with each other for predicting the enrichment from you know, peak to peak, the height of the peak basically across this data set, which was in a, a prostate cancer um, related <laughs> cell line. Um, and for the GR, we get a great validation that is the coefficient for the predictor for the wrong weight matrix is zero. Um, uh, and it's, and it, you know, it's very significant for the right weight matrix. Um, so that's good. For the AR, is the picture is a little more murky, and we're trying to decide whether this is like a failed validation or maybe there's some biology to this because actually the GR is capable of substituting for the AR in prostate cancer resistance and not the other way around. Um, I do want to end by just mentioning uh, Chaitanya's algorithm, which is uh, a principal maximum likelihood framework where we infer the delta Gs directly from the sparse uh, CELEX data without building Kamer tables. So we can just seed it with everything zero, and in a few minutes it will give us the energy uh, parameters. Um, and I'm just going to show you an example of this on the Hox EXD complex uh, that we looked at before with Kamer tables. Uh, this actually was uh, uh, created by, by Remo's lab. Um, and this is the result of the fit of either just a, a PWM, like SAM-like model with base parameters only, uh, again, with no seeding, uh, fitting directly to the round one of the CELEX data. Or you can also add shape uh, parameters as predictors um, in these models. And we're just, we just finished the, all the technical work on the implementation and the algorithm for inferring these parameters, and we're now moving to applying and, and validating uh, this further against other uh, data sets. just wanted to end with uh, thanking the people in my lab uh, who did the work and also Richard and Remos and Miles' lab for this talk in particular, Liang, who did a lot
lot of experiments uh, for this. Uh, Richard and Remo um, and, and I have um, funding from NIH to work on this, and there's a lot of stuff that we're hoping to tell you about in the next uh, half year or, or year that we've been working on. Um, and everybody with a red star has a poster at this conference, and I encourage you to go and talk to them. And thank you for your attention. Hi, thank you. Uh, so, don't you think that the, the in vivo differences in binding between androgen receptor and glucocorticoid are probably due to the interactions with other TFs? <coughs> Binding at flanking sites. Can you address that? Um, yeah. So that, that's definitely a um, consideration. And FOXA1, for instance, is a known cofactor. You know, for the first for ER was discovered, and also for 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 AR. But what we're trying to show here is not that we can completely explain. Kind of related to a comment that was made by one of the earlier speakers today. We're not. Um, our ambition or our claim is not that we can explain the chip data. Uh, completely using these simple in, vi in vivo models built from the Celex data. We're just trying to use the chip data here, uh, right, to show that, that the difference between these models is, is significant. It could be that, um, right, so is this additional flanking specificity that we found, does it give you significant predictive, uh, increased predictive uh, power? On top of that, all the cofactor interactions, chromatin accessibility, and all that, you know, cell type specificity will Will, will definitely be a big part of, of explaining completely the chip data. Hey, Armin, great work. Um, so uh, a clarification question. When you compared the chip data to the models, the, w w did you say you're having both motif models simultaneously uh, or, and, and modeling competition in some way? Could That's you right. Could you clarify that slide a little yeah. more? So, so this... <coughs> On the, on the left, the dependent variable is, is basically the, the coverage or the enrichment uh, in the IP for a particular region, you know, sequence under the peak. So you have, there's a peak somewhere, the peaks vary in height, right? So that's the, on the left-hand side, the variation in the dependent variable. And then there's a sequence under those peaks that we slide our weight matrices over, the two, the one for AR and then for GR, and we get some kind of sliding some affinity, right? Uh, or we can take the maximum. But, um, um, and um, so that, that's, those are the independent variables. And then we're just trying to get the coefficients using simple linear regression. Not some of the two. No, well, we're, so there's, there's, a, there's a, a slope for the AR predictor and there's an independent slope for the GR predictor. If, we, if I fit a model for only AR, it would be very significant, you know, uh, and uh, for GR as well. It's when, uh, when uh, actually Tomas and you know, Vinzo earlier uh, looked at this, and they let the two predictors compete. That you know uh, becomes a matter of yeah. So then, when they compete, only then can you really start to see this difference, right? because they're more similar to each other than different. But we're interested in knowing whether the difference is real. So it's um, it's been tr tricky to find a good way to validate this because chip data is also so complex. Yeah. 